perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and um, for um, participating in my talk. And I also want to thank um, Bina for um, inviting me. Um, so the most popular question is how do you pronounce your name? Um, uh, so my name is Taf Wee. So it's Taf and we like us. Um, so that's how it's pronounced. We can move to the next slide. So this talk today is about um, breaking the rules. Um, first, I wanted to start with um, just a little bit of background information about myself and then how I, um, why I think it's important to break the rules. So the next slide. Um, so this is pretty much me. <laughs> a lot of people ask, um, when did you when did you get into art? How did you know you wanted to be an artist? And just shortly after this picture was taken, in as you realize, my um, little polka dot um, dress. It was my favorite dress. <laughs> I re even remember my dad um, combing my hair. Um, hence the like wonky hairdo. Um, so I had started um, art when I was about five years old. I'd moved to a new school and, you know, suffering from separation anxiety, watching my mom leave, crying all, all day. And my teacher decided um, by the end of the first or second week that she would start us by painting every morning. So she handed me a paintbrush, um, some watercolors and a, co a coloring um, pad and told me to paint my feelings. So every morning before we started any kind of lesson, we would start by painting. And that was such a great pacifier. And I still remember the feeling that I had when I started painting. It was like breathing for me, it was better than writing or um, running around in the, the playground. Um, so the next slide you will see here um, was my first painting <laughs> that um, my dad actually saved since I was that age and he just gave it to me um, a few years ago. Um, so I remembered how I felt. So this, um, the emotion of painting and going through um, the process of expressing myself in that way felt so amazing. And um, I also remember playing with form and texture and color. And um, it was the best means for me to communicate, especially at that, a, a young age when you don't quite have that vocabulary. But when I was about 10, um, because in, I was born in, in Jamaica and the school system there really forces um, you to learn um, and figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life really early. So when I was about 10 years old, I decided that I wanted to be an artist and I did everything um, art related since then. Um, during um, my time as a teen, I would often visit family in North America and sometimes go to Europe. And I fell in love with Montreal and that made me decide that when I finished high school that I wanted to have another cultural experience. And that's when I decided to um, study art in Montreal. So we can go to the next slide. So for me, it was learning more about the craft and learning as much as I could about um, different mediums. I really thought that I was just going to be a painter um, so I studied um, fine arts and slash studio art in CJEP, um, which is the equivalent to college in um, um, like Ontario and this part of Canada too. And it was not until about my, um, the end of my uh, semester in CJEP, I discovered design and I went to Concordia University after that to study design. Um, which I found really helped to um, balance my process and give me um, um, more um, 
um, a, a stronger foundation, not just in art and design, but how I could um, really blend the two. And it allowed me to explore different mediums that I really never thought about exploring before. And um, there was also other cultural experience that I was going through at the time because it's a completely different world to me. Um, it wasn't, you know, it's um, French is the, the, the main um, language that's spoken there. So everything was very new and very interesting. And while I was there, the very a common question that you get asked in Montreal is, where are you from? And um, as I was meeting other people who um, had um, lots of hundreds of years of history in a, in a, in a place, it made me realize that, you know, like um, to look into my, um, my background, uh, my ethnic background, and this made me go on a quest to um, look in West Africa at first. So I looked at the art that people made in West Africa. And then I started to expand from there into the other countries in Africa. And I really, for me, was um, more fascinated with pre-colonial art made by indigenous people. Um, and um, that made me explore the work of the people who, um, what they made, how they made it, um, what was the meaning um, behind it. And I noticed that there was a common theme of using symbolism and um, pattern. And also a lot of the first textiles were, um, the, a lot of the first artworks were done on textiles and on um, natural fiber like um, stone and wood. And I really liked the tactile nature of it and the organic nature of it. And then I started to, to move outside of the continent of Africa and noticed that there are so many similarities with indigenous cultures in Asia, um, in Australia, and here in North and, uh, North and South America. So there was this really beautiful thread of storytelling through um, garment and through textiles and um, for me, as a painter at the time, who was studying design, I never really um, saw the differentiation of textiles and painting as um, not just as a medium, but as um, fine, as art. And so I started to really explore different um, textile techniques within my painting practice. And I started to work um, outside of the traditional um, medium of painting um, because I always incorporated um, some form of my painting within my work, um, whether it's um, graphic design, whether it's um, digital product design or physical product design, um, as you'll see that, I've, uh, that I now make. Um, I've always tried to incorporate um, the use of my hand as in like the main medium that I love within my work. Um, so the next slide. So while I was um, still attending university, I would have to take um, not just design courses, but I would have to take fine art courses. And I took um, a few painting courses and I had this um, one instructor, um, professor um, in particular, who um, didn't quite um, see the vision that I was, um, I had for myself. And, you know, I was still trying to find who I was and what um, my needs of expression would really end up looking like and how I would develop it. And um, she said to me, uh, your culture places too much of an emphasis on your work, and she failed me for painting. This was the first time that I had ever failed a painting class, and if there is anything like a textile nerd or a painting nerd, that would be me. And I was completely devastated that anyone would say that and wouldn't really see what I saw and what I loved. And, you know, I eventually um, 
fought for that grade and fought for um, what I, I felt was um, fair and fought for her to, to really see um, the vision that I had. Um, unfortunately, she didn't quite, she probably still doesn't agree, which is fine. Um, but that, um, that to me was just one person's view of the world and that um, they, she just thought that I should conform to a traditional, very Eurocentric view of what art and what painting um, is. And um, I just didn't agree with that. So um, it really led me to really investigate different um, ways of taste, which I ended up taking a philosophy course, which really explained to me, you know, the process and how people see um, what people like, how people see um, art or anything that they think that they like, that it's really just a representation and we're, our brains are pretty much um, small Pinterest boards and throughout your life, if you've only just been introduced and if you've only just seen one way of, of or one cultural way of, of viewing um, art or viewing your world, it then um, more than likely you're gonna think that's the, the only way there is, when there's lots of ways of doing um, everything that we, uh, we're um, experiencing now. Um, and um, the second um, uh, rule, so that was the first rule, and you will see how I um, completely broke that. Um, rule that I had from school. And then the second um, rule was um, through other um, senior artists. After I finished school, I started exhibiting. Um, I had moved back to Jamaica after I, right after I finished, um, I, right after I finished university and I started um, working in advertising, but I also always had my fine art practice because it's just um, something that I pretty much can't live without doing. And I had um, a lot of senior artists who I had grown up um, admiring their work from um, Jamaica. And um, one in particular, um, Jean Pearson, um, lovely human, um, he said, you do too many things. You need to stick to one medium. People will only know you for one thing. And whatever they know you for, and what are you, whatever you're um, famous for, um, that's what you need to do, and you need to just stick to that. We disagreed. I said, "There's no way I can't. Um, I can know. Um, I can be informed by so many di different techniques, and not try to experiment with those techniques, um, because to me." Um, it makes me a better artist and a better human being by knowing the process and seeing how it was done and how we can improve a process and um, how we can express ourselves as, oh, well, how I can express myself in different forms, but it's still coming from, there's still a thread to me that that's linked to um, my voice and sticking to one medium has never been um, uh, my favorite thing to do and um, to me the life is really boring if <laughs> you know as much as orange is a beautiful color or black and white is beautiful um, if I never saw anything else I think um, that would um, limit my view again of, of um, the world and how I could um, express that and uh, three is um, also seeking acceptance. Um, it applies to the first two rules. It's saying, okay, this is what the the traditional um, the, the traditional way of creating art and being an artist is. So, do I accept? Do I accept the traditional way of only selling my work in a gallery, only being a painter, keeping um, culture out of my work, 
painting in just um, one medium, um, would that be true to who I am? And would that be um, the best way to be for me? And my answer to that was no. Um, so for the next slide. So for me, I uh, am a painter, I'm an, a fine artist. So I make fine art, so I exhibit, um, and I do exhibit in galleries, um, primarily um, um, non-commercial galleries, and um, I do product design, and I make reproductions of my work. Generally, that's something that's um, not um, seen as um, the traditional way of being as an artist, but I found that, um, uh, a, when I do fine art, it gives me a space where I can create installation pieces that I wouldn't normally be able to do and have people experience if I was just selling my work online. So that's one way for me to express myself. And product design for me right now, it's through textiles. Um, I'm exploring other types of mediums and how people can interact with my work on a daily basis because not everyone um, interacts with art in the same way. Some people prefer soft art, like textile design with cushions. Um, and some people prefer hanging, um, wall hangings, and some people prefer, prefer um, um, traditional paintings. So for me, it's about um, connecting with, my, with an audience, with the viewer, with someone who um, is interested in having a part of my story. Um, within their space and I make reproductions of my work because I remember what it was like when I was in art school and I only had you know enough money to buy a postcard every time I went to an art show or an art print of someone I really admired and I wanted to share my work with um, the, the university and high school version of myself, the, the budding um, art collector. And um, it's, I haven't looked back since. It's been um, actually one of the best things I've done for myself and for um, people who are my patrons. Um, the next uh, slide. So this is what my fine art looks like. Um, I started working on wood uh, about um, 10 or so years ago. And um, I started carving in the wood. So it um, may seem as if it's, um, some people see it and think it's thread, but it's also a layering of, there's lots of color on there, layering of color. So I usually mix my, mix my colors. I do it on, on the canvas. And um, the base color is red, um, which is for me um, the connecting fluid between all of us as human beings that we're all the same color on the inside. And then I cover it with um, my, uh, with oil. Um, which is representing of the, my skin color and I carve in it through so that you can see the core of the, um, the piece, the artwork below. And um, it's really to speak about um, isms and um, what it feels like to be marginalized um, for um, people to see me and all they really see is my color and it's not what what do we have in common what does she um um what does she feel what what is she thinking and applying those limitations to me and um this is the form i used to express myself and i used carving because um i was very um interested and intrigued by the use of of scarification in a lot of indigenous cultures use scarification on their bodies as a form of beautification and the patterns that they have made um, and how beautiful it looks uh, on on the 
the skin. So for me, this was like treating the canvas as a skin. Um, uh, this piece now is a part of the permanent collection in the, the City of Ottawa's art collection. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then the, the, that one was a first part of what, what these look like. This is the evolution of that work. Um, so ultimately the, the patterns and the imagery and the lines within my artwork really represent people. Um, so it's, I have been deconstructing culture and people's, um, pra people's practice, um, art practice. Um, for years, and for me, I um, would have people in patterns, you know, this is um, before, and I've started to somewhat extract the shape and the form of people and, um, and um, applied it on the canvas in this way, in the use of pattern making and mark making, which is also a very um, common, uh, language within um, the fine art practice of uh, indigenous peoples across um, different continents. And um, this is from my last show that I had in March um, called Scars. So the next slide. So here is where I have began to um, fuse my textile work and my fine art life, um, which was also a rule to never really um, combine um, um, different, um, uh, you know, uh, different types of works this way. And I really wanted to play with that. So I wanted to also play with the shape, pattern, form, use of minimalism with, um, the maximalism and pattern making and have that huge contrast with, with both. Um, so the, the top pieces here are made of wood and the bottom is on um, canvas. You can see the next slide. So these are um, paintings um, that I do on uh, with India ink on paper. Um, so at first this is, was me really experimenting with, um, with patterns and um, some people um, may call them surface pattern design. Um, uh, you know, for me, they're just a different form of painting. And I started to take these pieces and really experiment with textiles. Um, with this work and what I also do is combine um, techniques that I would normally you would normally use as a textile designer and apply it as a painter and then I go back and use these same artworks onto textiles um, so if you see the next slide here you can see an example of that. So this is on the right is the, um, the painting that I made into a screen print. And then on the left side, it's my, um, it's a, my textiles that I've made with that. And for me, the use of um, the, this technique that I've done um, with the digital printing on textiles, um, was um, specifically done because I didn't want to do the traditional way of, of um, dyeing on fabric because also dyeing is um, fabric dyeing. It's very, it cons you consume a lot of water. There's a lot of waste and um, a lot of the, the materials and dyes that you use are very toxic. And for me, I didn't want to be contributing to the pollution that was already there. So um, this technique was really, um, this medium was really perfect for these um, techniques. And um, it's also um, printed on Belgian linen, which is um, 
also doesn't use as much water as um, um, uh, say cotton for example so you know there was a lot of research and thought behind it because I really wanted to um, pay attention and be mindful of the way our ancestors um, honor the land and our environment and I wanted to take that I also was uh, inspired by that and I wanted to um, bring that into um, the modern or modern life and um so this these are this is what i've done with um with my reproductions and this is um some examples of my product design so the next slide you can go on the next slide oh is there a, is there any more I think there's a few more behind there. Yes. Yes. Then, yes, yeah, so, right. Thank you. <laughs> I was a little freaked out. <laughs> um, so here are some more examples of um, my textile design and me playing with minimalism, maximalism, the use of symbols and icons to um, create a story within my work. Um, for example, the circles for me represent people from an, an aerial view. And I um, often put people's, my little um, imperfect circles in my work as um, also a form of storytelling. And at times I also put obstacles in their way as we all have, have obstacles within our life. And it's how we get through those obstacles, not just as an individual, but together. So, um, the, so, so the one on my pattern, sorry, my pillow on the right um, was also inspired um, by um, patterns that um, would appear on um, the branches, like when I would go for a, a snowshoeing, um, which is also why my color palette is um, just black and white, because I'm usually inspired by the by nature and the huge contrast within color um, and texture when um, it's the, the the land is filled with snow and uh, the snow just isolates um, people as a um, as a shape or even the trees and just the water kind of peeking out from different sections on a frozen lake I really find that um, very beautiful and that informs um, that also informs my work and the uh, next slide and like I said before, um, I wanted to create work that um, almost everyone could enjoy at some different price points. And I made um, postcards and some of these, um, the patterns that you see there on my soft art, AKA pillows, are um, also available in postcards for people to just have a little um, snippet of that work and that form of storytelling um, to be a part of their lives and just be as an inspiration to, um, to them. And then the next slide. And then that was me um, painting this, um, this summer. I was doing a mural for the Vancouver Mural Festival. So my work has now left the canvas and it's gone on giant buildings. And um, it's here located at the corner of Granville and I think 15th. Um, it's um, on the Zebra Club. Um, it's their building in South Granville. It's, uh, so you should check it out if you ever get the chance. And I've just attached some of my contacts where you can find me. And thank you. And that's it. So if you have any questions, um, here I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I actually do have here um, a few questions already. Yes. So yes. the first, the first question is: How easy is it to break the rules? And what were your main challenges? Um, it's never easy when you're breaking the rules because you will always come up um, with resistance because rules are there for a structure and for people to conform and for um, things to be done in the same way that it's been done for the past how many um, decades. And for me, it's, it's if you follow the rules and if everyone's following the rules, then everybody's going to be doing the same thing. And it doesn't um, allow space for diverse thoughts and, uh, and, and um, different options. So I think it's really important to know what the rules are. So, you know, okay, if, if, say for example, within photography and lighting and the, the, rule of, the rule of third, you know it because this is there for balance and for having negative and positive space. But if that's not the emotion that you're trying to, to evoke, then that rule is, um, it, it, that rule is not for you. You know, so yes, you're going to come up against resistance. When I, I told my teacher I didn't agree with her, she was upset that I didn't agree with her. And, you know, um, so no, it's not going to be pleasant all the time. Um, but that's just the nature of breaking the rules. So no, it's not going to always be easy, but it's definitely worth it. It's definitely 100% worth it. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, thank you very much. So I have first, I have um, one comment and then a few extra questions. So the comment is from, from Myra, an yes. exquisite Hi. and thoughtful presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I you. Have, I have here um, another question. Uh, do you mostly work alone or is it a very collaborative process art for you? I think it depends on the medium. And for a lot of painters, like if you're painting um, artwork for an exhibition or just for a commission, you tend to just be very isolated. And it's something also that a lot of people don't realize how um, uh, isolating and how sometimes it can be lonely as an artist because you have your space and, um, and you're doing your research on your own and you're doing the work on your own. So yes, a lot of times I end up working alone. Um, with that um, being said, if, with a, a mural, when you're doing a mural that was like 25 feet high, <laughs> you know, by how many feet um, wide and it's a wraparound. No, I did, definitely didn't work alone. Um, I had um, my husband who um, helped me a lot with, with the mural. Um, we did it mostly for most of the days. And then we also got a technical artists that the festival provided us to help. So, so with things like the mural, uh, definitely no. Um, with things like my textiles, I, um, after stitching my finger on my mom's, um, on my mom's uh, sewing machine when I was a kid, I had this huge pair of sewing um, that I've, you know, now gotten over. Uh, but I prefer um, working with other local seamstress and um, people who like that, um, like to sew, um, uh, uh, to work with my textiles. So no, I don't always do things on my own. Um, my friend in Toronto um, helped me a lot with my, um, when I was starting out with um, my textile pieces, my friend um, Arona. Uh, who also is a textiles artist who advised me a lot on some of the things that I should and shouldn't do after I, you know, made mistakes. So for me, it's, you know, I reach out to other people who I admire um, and have um, kept a community online when I started a blog. 
um, uh, in a few years ago with Canadian art. I had done that for about three or four years, and I met a lot of the artists within the community, without throughout Canada, who have who I still um, keep in touch with. And if I ever need um, any advice or have any questions, I reach out to them. And um, they're amazing with support. Also the local Vancouver arts community, have, they're also um, really good support system. So um, for you, if you are looking to work with or collaborate with another artist, just reach out and ask them yes that's good yeah so just reach out i think you know um you know if they're busy um it will eventually work for you but um you know it's, it's we're pretty much doing we're in this together and sometimes when you're lost in in your work in the studio you forget that you're not doing it alone because there's tons of us around pretty much doing the same thing Thank you. I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> I have here um, a question from Philippe. Uh, have you ever thought of teaching? Since your story is so amazing, it would be amazing to know that someone like you would empower and give direction to young artists. That's like so nice for you to say. And yes, I have taught. <laughs> I did teach. I taught. Um, so when I, after I moved back um, to Jamaica for a about three or four years, I taught um, at university, the University of the West Indies when I was in Jamaica. And then when I moved back to Canada, I taught at um, uh, post-secondary um, level two at the college, Algonquin College. Um, I, what I find with teaching, it's really time consuming, especially teaching um, with the, in the email um, era that you can spend six hours or eight hours teaching and then I, you'll get home and literally have 250 emails in your inbox that you have to like respond to in 24 hours. So I found it got really overwhelming for me and it was really difficult for me to um, balance teaching and my own practice. So I ended up having, after I taught, I had this huge artist um, uh, painters block um, that I eventually got over but it's um, the workshops most definitely I love workshops and um, I definitely it's it's something that I would um, want to do and will be getting into um, I might do short snippets say on Instagram and then longer ones um, 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 with one-on-ones if people are interested and I can add that to my website and you can send me an email too if you'd be interested. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I have here um, another question. Um, your first, the first picture you've shown, the wood carving one, yes. I felt very emotional watching it. Um, so how long did it take from start to end? The wood pieces um, actually take me um, the longest to work on. They can take me um, about six or eight weeks because it's layering of color. And um, now that I've moved to Vancouver, um, it's a lot more humid. So it, it takes, and I work with the oil sticks. So the oil sticks, for some reason, it takes about a week and a half, especially now in winter, sometimes two weeks just to dry. So each layer really um, takes me longer just for the paint to cure, to be at a, a, a point when I can work on it again. So about eight weeks. Thank you. Uh, so I have here um, another question from, from Michael. So Michael is asking, did you ever thought about writing a book or a short story book as your paintings and all your art always seems to come with some emotional story with? I have. So if you know a publisher, you can let me know. <laughs> but I have thought about it. It's um. You know, like I've got this bucket list and um, an illustrated short story is definitely on my bucket list. So thank you for saying that. And, um, you know, um, I, uh, Marlon James, who's a Jamaican author, says that if 
you're looking for the perfect story and you haven't found it, it means that you, you're meant to write it. And I have, it's something that I've been really thinking about doing for the past five years or so. And um, hopefully I'll be able to do it within the next year. Thank you. So here uh, I have another question, some from, from Alina. She's thanking you for all uh, the information and for your beautiful story sharing. Thank you very much. And do you enjoy working with deadlines or would you prefer having more freedom while working? Um, so when, so outside of my fine art life, I uh, worked as an art director um, and creative director um, in an ad, in a few ad agencies actually. And it is 100% deadline um, driven. You, you know, lose days of sleep just to make sure that you get that deadline. And there is something about that adrenaline that you, the rush that you get from doing that work that I do at times use to um, produce work. Um, it's good and bad because, you know, you definitely need some downtime after that. So I, deadlines aren't, um, it's not an issue for me um, because I have gone through the ringer of doing, uh, of working in ad at an ad agency. So I find that, you know, for me, I tend to like to even give myself a deadline, even if it's just for my personal project. If it's a new art print that I'm putting out, I'd like to put the deadline there. I'll tell people in my newsletter that, uh, you know, I'm, this is when I'm going to launch my new print or something um, so that it will make sure, I'll make sure that I get it done for that timeline. So um, deadlines aren't something that intimidate me at all. Thank you. Uh, so next, next question. Um, I, this is from someone who couldn't be here today, but yeah. she's going to watch live. So um, I, I promise I will ask this question. So what, what was the biggest challenge you've ever had to face growing up as a young artist? Hmm. Wow, <laughs> that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, Wow, there's like um, small child, you know, because in life you get the hurdles that you always have to um, uh, jump over. But for me, um, it was actually the biggest hurdle was losing my parents. I lost my mom in 2016 in August and um, I was completely... Um, lost and then I lost my father in 2017 also in August so that in with my life in general because my I my work is about my life and my experience and the way I, I tell my stories and um, it was really trying to motivate myself um, and pushing myself um, um, in ways that I never thought I would have to push myself and to be uh, motivated to just get out of bed and, and be energetic and to be thoughtful and productive when I'm, I, I just I wasn't feeling those emotions and not really wanting to put the emotions of um, sadness in my work. Um, but you know, it really, um, eventually that's really what helped me. It's like getting back to work, putting um, ink on paper, and even in the past summer here, while um, we were going through all, we're going through, you know, um, every, all the emotions of COVID and of people losing not just their jobs and their livelihood and their apartments, but their families, you know, and um, then watching, um, you know, the, all the 
the, the demonstrations and civil rights process, protests happening, not just in the States, but here too, um, that was also very emotional. And, you know, like when you go through anything that's traumatic, it brings back whatever emotions you had with the most traumatic thing that you've experienced. And then for me, it was also, okay, how do I work through this emotion too? And then I, you know, I, you know, was commissioned to do that mural. And um, it was hands down the best thing that I, you know, I, the best ex working experience that I've ever had. The people at the BMF were completely amazing, but the community on a whole was so appreciative of me being in that their space and um, and bringing art um, to their community. And um, it really helped with um, that healing process for me. And they too would come and visit me every day and say that I was doing that for them. So it was a, the most beautiful symbiotic um, relationship that I've had so far. I'm hoping that it's, um, the beginning of of um how all my um working relationships would be you know even though life isn't perfect but um that would be um my hope but definitely working making art through um a pandemic um was definitely um um, it was difficult at first, but then, like I said, it's like breathing and it's the best thing for me. And it just brought me back to when I was five years old and, and my teacher gave me um, a paintbrush as a pacifier and I've been using that um, ever since. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Actually, it's halfway. Um, I have here a, a comment and then I have one last, last question here lined up. Uh, so the comment is from, from Svetlana. So Svetlana is um, appreciating a very inspiring presentation and that breaking the rules and going against stereotypes is not for everybody. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Tafi, for sharing. And so thank you. Thank you. No, it's, it's not for everyone. And you ultimately have to do what makes you feel comfortable. And um, for me, um, conforming doesn't to somebody else's way of, of being is not comfortable for me so that's why i choose to um be true to who i am and that's where i find comfort and you know people who love you and appreciate your work and what i do they people you will attract them so you will attract your own um own tribe you know and your own community and um, so that's what I'm doing through my work and the way I express myself. Thank you. So the last question that I have here is, um, speaking about emotions, whenever I look at your art and I have looked into your shop as well, the emotion is hope. I actually find a very hopeful work. Uh, yeah. Do you feel hopeful about the future and where the humanity is going? I actually do. I do feel hopeful. Um, uh, this, what's happening now with um, with the protests is not. It's not unique, and even the pandemic. It's happened before, and we have survived it as people. And we are this. To me, we are family. We're all family, and right now we're witnessing a very public family feud. And this is um, one generation saying to the other generation, you need to make space for us because we are a part of you. And um, you're, if you eliminate us, you're eliminating a part of yourself. So, um, this is, I am really hopeful for it. I have seen what um, this same protest also happened um, in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, um, started in Haiti, went throughout and even went up to North America um, um, for emancipation. And it has um, ultimately made um, 
Jamaica a better country. I could see where people, you know, our motto as Jamaicans are um, out of many one people. And so, you know, it was put into the, the system of the institutionalized system that we are connected and it was instilled in us since we were kids that we are a part of each other. So now this is what is happening here. And it's only because it's being so well documented that now we are really seeing um, what everyone's saying and, and we're so connected and, and we are able to reach out and get information that we weren't able to get before. And, and um, I do feel hopeful that it will get better and that things are changing and things will change because that's the only option that we have. And now we're also hearing voices that we've never heard from before. And, um, and they're sharing their stories about how how they feel um, when they're in a space that should be for them, but it's not for them, and how people um, treat them, you know? And I have been listening to so many stories from so many people who look like me and people who don't look like me. And um, it's made me a better person, so I'm sure it's doing the same thing for everyone. And eventually we will all, some people are just a little, you know, um, slower to change than others, but eventually we will all get to the finish line together. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I don't have any, we don't have any further questions. I purposely um, have the um, where to find Tafui. So please follow her on, on Instagram or shop or even reach out to her um, for partnerships or collaborations just to tell how an amazing artist she is, which thank you very much. It was a pleasure having pleasure. you as a presenter and to close our art talks. So I just want to thank everyone again for being with us for the past five months, five and a half months. Uh, so hopefully we'll come back with more artists, with more amazing presenters and more amazing stories as well. So have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful weekend. Again, Tafui, thank you so very much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming and for listening. Yeah. This talk will be available. It was recorded, so it will be available on our um, YouTube channel for our talks. So I will upload it anytime during today or even tomorrow so thank you all very much and have a lovely day thank you, thank you. bye bye, bye.